the benefit of the current net energy metering program is you're still grid connected. The utilities out here in California are really working hard to reduce the amount of credits that you get. If I was running a for-profit utility, I would do whatever is going to make me the most money. The big buzzword they're pushing right now, electric vehicles. I'm here today with David Vincent. He's the founder of ASIP Energy. They are a property owner's rep for commercial solar projects. Have you seen a lot of demand for the specialty you come in with? Yeah, it's, it's actually been, been great. This industry that we're in is, is very saturated. There's a lot of different contractors, different providers that are out there. And for property owners, the folks that are actually paying the bills, it's a big investment and they don't really have a way to accurately tell the differences between providers out there, between systems, between products. And throughout my career, I often saw times where different providers would be willing to call it bend the truth a little bit as far as their numbers, their productions, how much it'll save, that kind of stuff. And I've always had a path to market when dealing with clients where I'm honest, straightforward, and telling them the truth, right? And it's very difficult when you are a vendor because you might be in there talking to a prospective customer and there's three or four or five other people also talking to that customer at different times. And the customer don't know who to believe. They just, they, they're forced into situations where they end up making up their mind. And oftentimes it's really on bad information. So when we started ASAP Energy, we, we switched sides of the table is what we like to say. Instead of negotiating, you know, negotiating with a prospective buyer, we represent them. We sit on their side of the table and we help them to figure out what's real, what's not, the best choices, so on and so forth. And it has really been a great niche in the industry. Is this what your job sites typically look like? I know you're on one today. That is. So we're doing this podcast halfway through a client that we have who has 23 sites from, if you're familiar with the California landscape, it's from Wasco to Red Bluff. So there's like a few hundred miles in between. And we've already done, I think, 15 of the job sites so far. We've got eight more to go. So this is a, a nice little break. I'm against a, a nice walnut tree sitting here enjoying a, a quick bubbly. And then I get back on the road here in a little while and, and start heading south. So are you looking at the, the land here to put in a solar installation? Yeah, exactly. So what farmers, what farmers face is they have extremely high water pumping costs, right? So they're, they're either moving the water from the ground out to the orchards or they are taking it out of canals and running it through what they call booster pumps, which has that water has to get from the canals out to the actual plants themselves. And what you can do in California, in most of the utility districts, the, the big ones anyways, you can put one big system in and the energy you get off of that system, you get credits and those credits can be applied to every other meter that the farmer has on the ranch. So you might have 10 different meters on a ranch you can put one system in located in one convenient area and, and get those credits throughout the entire property. Is it like a monetary tax credit? So there's monetary tax credits associated with the purchase of the system. But what I'm talking about here are the bill credits. So if say you're spending, say you're spending a million dollars on PG and E just for electricity to, you know, pump your water. Well, you can put a solar system in and cut that bill down by. 70, 80%. So yeah. And, and when I say credits, you, you get the credit through one meter and they apply bill credits through all of the other meters. Is that something you see staying around for a long time, that type of system? Well, yes and no. The utilities out here in California are really working hard to reduce the amount of credits that you get. Recently, PG&E actually in April launched a new program that significantly reduce that, that, that credit program. 
It reduced it. If you've heard buzzwords in the industry called NEM 3.0, it's their new version. The average credit on a typical south facing, you know, solar project, say in the middle of the valley, you know, you went from credit offsets in the 20 some cents per kilowatt hour down to closer to the six cents per kilowatt hour. So they've reduced it quite a bit. There's still a period right now through the end of the year where you can still get in, sign up and, and get your reservation. So it will last for a little while longer, but the future is going to be surrounding battery storage, a lot more energy storage, and then putting that energy back out at night. So the economics will still work. You just have different, a different way that you'll have to go about when that energy is actually exported out to the grid. So will that be your next area of expertise on the battery storage side? Yeah. Yeah. We get, we're getting a pretty good pull for it right now that through my first 18 years, we've always said the grid is the storage in a way, because when you, when a system overproduces, it puts the, the power back on the grid. Now, the advantage to that is obviously that power goes right back on and goes over to you, to the neighbors and the neighbor uses that power. So from the utilities perspective, they have these power generators that are exporting and, and it's, it's offered a ton of grid stability. Because the utilities, they have their big, their big power generators are through hydro, through natural gas, through these massive, say, renewable energy projects down in the desert. But then that power has to be, has to be broadcast out to the rest of the state, right? So you go through these transmission lines and distribution lines and the amount of power loss that goes through when that, that whole distribution circuitry goes out through the rest of the state is massive. So what's been dubbed as rooftop solar in the past, it's the, when, when customers own their own generators, it's the greatest thing that's happened to the grid as far as stability goes really forever, let's say. Because they're, they're not operating on the grid at that point. They're storing their own energy. Well, they are. See, that's the, the benefit of the current net energy metering program is you're still grid connected. So even if, say, your system went down, you wouldn't, your lights wouldn't even flicker inside the house, right? You, it's instantaneous. You'd be getting power from the grid, right? But what has happened traditionally is when you get to the end of the line, right? And, and you say you have, your, you have your power generator. It goes out to a, a distribution network. It goes all the way to the very last client at the end of the power lines. Well, the power, once it gets there, it's not very stable. and in California, some number of years ago, we used to experience a ton of brownouts, blackouts, and that was just because the, the grid couldn't keep up. Since then, the only thing that's really changed is the mass adoption of customer-owned generation, like solar projects. And I don't believe we've had a, a brownout or blackout in you know, over a decade, right? But what that, what's that done is that guy that's at the end of the line, well, now he has a generator. He has a solar project in and he's stabilizing that line. So his power, when it's being exported onto the grid, actually goes back down the line and then feeds the other services that are, that are on that. So I've heard an estimate that just customer owned generation alone in the state of California, this does not include anything that the utility owns or these big massive acres worth of sites that you'll see when driving up and down the valley or out in Mojave desert. But just the customer-owned generation is somewhere in the neighborhood of two gigawatts worth of solar. And that's a, that's a massive amount of, of putting power back onto the grid to help all Californians. So how does that work? The customer-owned generation, right? So I have solar panels on my house and I'm pushing energy into the grid. Do I so, receive something for doing so? That's correct. Yeah, so, the, so way back when, let's say 20 years ago or so, Senate Bill 1 went through and it it pushed the utilities to come up with what they call net energy metering. And what that is, is, is if you imagine the old meters, they're dials, they're these circular dials. And when you're using power, that dial spinning one direction and you're, 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 you're buying that energy from the utility. Well, when the, when the solar you have on your roof is generating, say exactly the same amount of power you're using, well, that dial is still not moving at all. And now all of a sudden your solar starts creating more. Well, now the meter starts spinning backwards. And when they first came out with the program of net energy, 
what they were saying is, hey, if you spin it forward 100 times and you spin it backwards 90 times, your bill's only going to be for 10. And that is the net in net energy metering. Since then, obviously, they've gotten a lot more sophisticated with electric meters, smart meters, everything else, but the concept has still been the same. So that's why you see almost all installations out here of not having additional battery systems with them. They've, they've just been by themselves. The new program that the utilities put forward, if you want to make it at all economically feasible, you're going to have to add battery systems to it, to your system. You're going to have to use that power on site. And then when you export, it's going to have to be at certain times of the day, which really are like six, seven, eight, nine o'clock at night. So the sun will be down and you'll be relying on your battery to export power back onto the grid. And are they doing that because it benefits them more financially? <laughs> well, it depends on who you ask. But if I was running a for-profit utility, I would do whatever is going to make me the most money. And if you look at the utilities, the big buzzword they're pushing right now, they're completely behind electric vehicles, okay? They're pushing electric vehicles. Well, what does that mean to the amount of power California is going to use? It's going to skyrocket. I think what's our, I think it's 2035, if I remember right, that our governor wants all passenger vehicles to be electric. Well, the amount of power it's going to take out here is going to be crazy. But at the same time, the for-profit utilities pushed and got the California Public Utility Commission to believe that solar is a bad thing. And if, I, if somebody puts it in at their house, then somebody else who can't have it down the road is, has to pay more for their energy. And, and it's, it's a concept that they ran with. We know it not to be the case because there's programs out there for, for all types of folks, whether you, you live on the top of a hill in a big mansion or not. There's programs that are out there, but the utilities pushed this through, got the Public Utility Commission to buy in, made the change to the program, saying they don't need any more solar. And then within a month or so, the utilities put out an RFO asking for more solar. But solar they'll own, not you. Yeah, that's how it always works, isn't it? The <laughs> <Hey>, corporation, <laughs> they'll have to cut. It's, it would be a great system if we all had solar good. panels and we're pushing energy in and out of the grid and having a net metering. If we could do that nationally, that'd be amazing. But you're exactly right, because the, where, the, where the utilities should have been investing all along is in grid stabilization. Allow the customers to produce their own power, right? Then you can collect that and store it in big battery systems, that type of stuff. You, the amount of power that you can generate right off of the collective rooftops that are across the state, residential, and look at commercial. I mean, I don't know how often you fly, but flying to any of these airports, you look around at the mass amount of space that's just not being used on the top of these warehouses and that, that all can be used for energy collection. And then the, what the utilities could be doing is putting much smaller fields of batteries in instead of these hundreds and hundreds of acres of, of solar panels. Well, let the, let the customers produce the energy, you collect it, and then you deploy it out of the battery systems when the time's right. But that's not the way the current California landscape is proceeding. Well, hopefully in the next decade, we'll see it transition to something I more like so. I hope so. And there's a lot of folks. Last week, they we're a member of the California Solar and Storage Association. They had a great lobby day last week, and we met with some of the lawmakers down there, and, and most of them are for customer-owned generation, and they, they're thinking the same way. You get businesses, and again, we don't do residential projects, but you get businesses that rely on, on being able to put systems in and cut their costs. Well, if you take that away from them, simple economics is going to tell you if it's going to cost them more to pump water and grow food, well, what do you think is going to happen to the price of food at the store when you and I go to buy it, right? So a lot of the lawmakers are behind, you know, programs to, to make it better from this NEM 3.0 that just went into effect. So hopefully we'll see some legislation coming out as early as next year to, to make the program a little more tolerable for John Q. Public. Yeah, I mean, these collaborative efforts, at the end of the day, everybody becomes richer from them. 
So if you don't fight against the natural way of things, we start to progress further as a species, as humanity. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's very much true. <laughs> so David, if our listeners wanted to get in touch with you or your company, how would they do so? Yeah, you can, you can reach out to us various ways. You can reach out to me on LinkedIn if you want. I'm out there and relatively vocal. You can reach out to the company website is acipenergy.com. Or you can call me directly. My number is 530-777-2247. Any of those three ways works for me. Well, thank you, David, for coming on the show. And thank you, everybody, for listening to another episode of Failing to Success. I'm your host, Chad Kalecki. Make sure to subscribe, and we'll see you next time.